Thank you, Mike. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cosmo Lysla. I'm Director of Research Products here at Lux. And I'm thrilled to be kicking off day two of the Lux Executive Summit 2018. Now, yesterday, we heard some fantastic talks on a range of subjects. Kevin C. talked about data plus, science, uh, plus an, uh, insight and why it's so important to keep innovating around data plus insight. We heard from IBM's Dario Gill around some of the cutting edge research that is happening within artificial intelligence and within quantum computing. And over the past day and a half, I've had a chance to speak with, with many of you in the audience, and I hear a lot of excitement around adopting AI. I hear a lot of excitement around adopting advanced analytics, but also a lot of questions. Where do we start on this journey? What are the pitfalls to watch out for? What are the best practices to, to undertake? And so that is exactly what I'll be talking about this morning. And I want to begin with you, because as much as artificial intelligence is going to be driven by um, very, very clever data scientists and AI software developers, the thought leaders in this room, the business executives in this room, and the amazing companies in this room will be such an integral part of the way that the world adopts AI and how we manage that journey together. And so I want to begin with an audience poll here. To get a feel for the room, I would like you to put your hand up if you are currently leading an AI project. If you're currently leading an AI project, put your hand up. OK, great. Keep those up. And then let's broaden this out a little bit. If in your day-to-day -day work you were meaningfully impacted or are being part of an AI project, put your hand up. OK, awesome. So we've got some hands up. This is the beginning of a major change where, if I was to ask the same question two years from now or four years from now, this room is probably going to be a sea of hands raised up. Within a few years, almost everybody in this room is going to begin to work with AI, have their day-to-day -day work meaningfully impacted by artificial intelligence. You may even be in charge of these efforts. And these are not necessarily abstract questions like, hey, an R&D project within artificial intelligence. These are going to be business impact questions. So for example, Lauren, can you please lead a new AI project for us to help us develop products faster for our business? Or Joe, we're looking for a new AI partner to help us do advanced analytics and predictive analytics a whole lot better. Can you help us do that? And so there's a real sense of urgency here. And associated with that, there are questions around where do we begin on this journey? What are the pitfalls? What are the best practices? But before we jump too far into that, I did want to consider this statement, that almost everybody will start to be impacted heavily by AI. That's today a pretty bold statement, right? That might be a controversial statement. So I wanted to explore that a little bit. And I'll start by talking about Google. Now, I'm going to say some nice things about Google here. I'm also going to say some not so nice things about Google a little bit later on. But let's start with the nice things. Google's had a really good past 10 years. They've grown in revenue from about $10 billion to $100 billion over the past 10 years. And looking back over those past 10 years, Google's CEO is saying that the last 10 years have really been about building a world that is mobile first. But that is changing now, and the company 2017, 2018, right now is in the midst of a massive pivot. A $100 billion company is pivoting to be preparing for an AI first world. Now, compared to the next company I'm going to talk about, this is a flash in the pan. So as Dario highlighted yesterday, IBM has been around for more than a century, and they've seen their fair share of computing revolutions. And a quote from their CEO. I think exemplifies the coming decade really, really well. And she says, I am 100% convinced that every job that we know today is going to be affected by artificial intelligence. And how we will respond is going to be IBM's greatest business challenge. And I'd argue that's not just for IBM. For a lot of companies, that is the greatest business challenge. Now, at this point, you may say, that's fine for, for Google. That's fine for IBM. They're digital natives. What about, what about other types of problems? 
You know, what if I'm not Google? What if I'm not IBM? What about cows, right? What about companies that maybe are further afield and they don't work in a digital ecosystem to begin with? And even cows are not safe. So this is a new partnership by Cargill, uh, working with a startup that is doing facial recognition for cows. So they're looking to understand the health, the appetite, the behavior of cows um, with a goal of uh, better, better milk production, better productivity on the farm. Now, as, as compelling as cow-related anecdotes might be, um, as, as a scientist, I love data. So we dug into the data. We looked across hundreds of millions of papers and patents as part of a massive data science project. And so my colleagues yesterday introduced this framework, which is the Lux Tech Signal. And you see here, for machine learning, including deep learning, um, a fantastic trajectory. But we did this kind of experiment across more than 2,500 different technologies. And that ranged from materials, to digital, to health, to energy. And what we found after doing these kind of traces for more than 2,500 technologies is this. This is the leaderboard of what the world's attention in terms of innovation interest is turning towards. Right? So we have technologies like neural networks, more advanced varieties like convolutional neural networks. We have a lot of work on data, building data lakes, practicing data science, looking into labeled data. We have um, hardware innovations like edge computing, for example. Now, there's a lot of jargon in here, so I wanted to do a two-minute landscape, just a level set, um, as we dive deeper into the AI landscape. So, just about two or three minutes, and I'm going to dive into um, various facets here. And I want to begin with general AI, right? When people talk about AI, when the media talks about AI, and perhaps even, um, you know, folks within your companies talk about AI, this might be the image that comes to mind, right? So, we have this general AI, this is often uh, kind of the all-knowing AI, you know, think Terminator movies, usually doesn't end up so well for humanity. That is, that is not what we're talking about in this presentation, right? So we're focusing a lot more on specialized, narrow AI that has been designed to do particular tasks extremely well. So this might be, for example, uh, doing machine vision for application within the future of autonomy. As a subset of that, we have machine learning. So there's many ways to do specialized AI. Machine learning is currently getting a huge amount of attention because you're able to use massive amounts of data. You're able to take advantage of great computing power. Um, and that's been leading to a lot of very, very nice advances within the field. And the hottest part of all of this, a subset of this, is deep learning, right? You've probably been hearing a whole lot about deep learning. Um, and as Dario walked through yesterday, this mimics how the brain operates and has been using these layered networks to achieve exceptional performance in particular tasks. Now, the last part I want to introduce here is the people, right? So this is the talent from your data scientists to um, your engineers to your visualizers. This is the talent within your company or within the companies that you work with that can make all of this happen. Now, that was the two-minute version. There's a lot more details that uh, we have available as part of our upcoming tech pages. Um, these are available on the app, and they will be coming to our member site in about six weeks if you want to dive a whole lot deeper into this topic. But between all of those technologies, right, and between all of those different options, it leads to a very complex landscape today. And this is a quote about an organization that shall remain unnamed, but they spend billions of dollars, right? These are pretty savvy consumers when it comes to buying software. They spend billions of dollars on buying software. And when evaluated for how well they do AI, this is the quote, nobody in the department had a clue how to properly buy, how to field and implement AI. And that's not because they were incompetent, that they were stupid, that they didn't know what they were doing. But this is a really hard problem today. There's not really a black box that delivers the AI systems 
fully ready to go, perfectly ready for your company. And so on the other one hand, we have a lot of excitement about AI. On the other hand, we have kind of confusion around how do we go about deploying AI. And that can lead to this, which I'm going to call the deer in the AI headlights. And that moment where you might get asked to lead an AI project, we want to avoid being that deer in the AI headlights. We want to get really good at managing AI deployments, and we want to get good at it very, very quickly. And so for the second part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about three pitfalls to avoid as you begin your AI journey. There's not just three, absolutely not. But these three, I think, are a pretty good place to start as we start to develop our AI roadmap. Now, number one is being very careful of which flavor of AI you decide to jump into. And so we just talked about how deep learning is the hottest area of AI. It performs exceptionally well for particular problems, like, for example, machine vision. And so it might be tempting to say, if AI performs, uh, if deep learning performs the best, let's start there. And I'd argue that's not always the case. And I'll draw an analogy here. When you're first learning how to drive, this is probably the car you want to learn how to drive in, right? A Toyota Corolla, friendly, you get in, you know where everything is. You do not want to learn how to drive in something like this, you know, Formula One car. And to me, this is kind of the difference between simple old school data science versus deep learning. You know, there's certain applications where deep learning is absolutely the way to go, right? There's certain times when Formula One car is exactly what you need. But as you're getting started, or even when you're looking more broadly, you know, if you're taking your kids to school, if you're doing your grocery shop, something like a Toyota Corolla is the tool for the job. So that is the first pitfall, I would say. Don't underestimate old school data science and think really carefully about the broader toolkit available to you and pick the right tool for the job. Sometimes deep learning is the right tool for the job, sometimes it's not. And we've seen this in our own research. So we do a lot of research on data science, we do a lot of research on artificial intelligence, and I'll give you a flavor for things within the material space. So materials informatics, there's a variety of ways for how do we apply data science and artificial intelligence to develop new materials. And we've spoken to a number of companies, so I'll give you a, a couple of highlights. Questec develops ultra high strength steels, and some of their materials have flown on the SpaceX missions. These are innovations that are already making a difference today, right? And they were found that in 1996, got a luck stick of positive. Another old school data science company is a subsidiary of VTT that was started in 1992. Um, they use simulation software for various applications, including wear resistance in mining, working already with materials companies, to uh, mining companies to improve their processes and operations. Again, luck stake, positive. Compare that with a more emerging company, Lumiant, that also looks at materials discovery, materials like, for example, lightweight composites, uh, but they use a machine learning powered platform. A lot of excitement around this company. We're excited about where this company is going, but they only got a lux take of wait and see. And this is part of a broader trend, right? So what I show here is um, Lux Innovation Grid. On one axis, we have business execution. On the other axis, we have technical value. And so we're going to zoom in here so that it's easier to see. And what we have here is a whole range of companies. Here's VTT that we talked about, the SpaceX rockets. Here's Questec with the applied um, um, materials within mining. And then here we have Lumiant, the more cutting edge machine learning company for materials discovery. And indeed, if we look across this, we see that today in 2018, the companies that perform best in our Lux analyst evaluation, the companies that get the positives, are more conventional data science approaches to materials discovery. Conversely, AI-based approaches are still emerging. Now, will this picture change two, four years from now? Absolutely. But today, this kind of difference does exist. The second pitfall that I wanted to talk about is how smart AI is. And there's a lot of reasons to think that AI is incredibly smart. So we have seen here, for example, from Google's DeepMind outfit, 
Um, this, um, this amazing research effort has just been crushing humans in game after game after game. Um, this is the game of Go. Some would say this is the most complex game that humanity has. And over the past couple of years, this program called AlphaGo has been beating champion after champion, most recently, the number one in the world when it comes to this game. This is a quote from that champion saying, this AI is like a god, right? So you look at these kind of advances, you look at these kind of breakthroughs, and it's easy to kind of get a feel for how mature and how well-developed and how powerful AI is today. But let's take that same company, Google, but let's look at another part of their outfit, which is Google Photos, right? This is something that many of you might be using today. Um, and one of the things they do is they, they, they use data science, they use AI to suggest improvements to photos, right? So you might upload a burst of photos and you might get something like a panorama. So let's look at these photos. You've got a beautiful mountain on the left and the right and you have some happy people in the middle. And now the AI is going to suggest a panorama. <laughs> this is what we get. All right, so that was the not so, part nice, uh, not so nice part about Google. But Google's not alone. I don't want to pick on Google, right? So Amazon has been investing heavily with an Alexa. Um, and now it's, it's had a recent problem where it's randomly laughing. This is a quote from somebody who was trying to go to sleep, and then Alexa let out a very loud, very creepy laugh, and they're worried for their safety. Um, Microsoft had some issues where their, their chatbots kept turning racist. Um, LG had a CS demo where their new assistant just refused to work on stage. And so I would call these, again, deer in the AI headlights moments. You don't want to be caught out like this when it comes to your AI deployment. Um, and, and these are somewhat funny, right? If, you, if, uh, if Alexa is acting a little bit weird, that is not the end of the world. But what if you deploy AI to manage you know, uh, a city's infrastructure or power grid? We talked to some companies that do that. So Via is um, a company that got a luck stick of positive. And what they do is they develop predictive maintenance using machine learning to help understand when a piece of equipment that runs or helps run part of the electrical infrastructure might need maintenance. And so partners already include um, J Japan's TEPCO power company. And a challenge that Via is facing is that their AI needs to convince humans to preemptively take down equipment that might need maintenance. And so to do that, we have to start thinking about human the loop systems. We have to think about explainability. And that is one of the things, one of the reasons why VIA got a Lux ticket positive, because they are looking in explaining you know, potential reasons around why the equipment would fail so that they interface well with us as humans to have a human in the loop system. <clears throat> the third pitfall that I wanted to dive into is bias and being very vigilant against biasing your AI. So this is a really interesting, really important study out of MIT. Um, and it's by no means the only study. But this is a project called Gender Shades that looks at three commercial face classification AI systems. And it looks at gender and race and the effects that that has in terms of accuracy. Right? And these are very important systems. These are systems that are used in security cameras, in immigration, in criminal justice, even things like glasses for visually impaired people. And what the research from MIT found is that there's a remarkable error rate difference in this algorithm. I mean, just to be perfectly frank, it's better at spotting white males. And the reason for that is because in this case, you know, a large part of the reason was that the data set that the AI was trained on had a lot of white males in it. Right? So this is another deer in the AI headlights moment. And so being very vigilant against bias is something that we need, we need to be very, very careful against. And luckily, tools are emerging to help with this. So this is a new tool that Google Research put out about half a year ago. It's called Facets. And what it helps do is to helps, it helps visualize your training data set. So when you look at your data, you can easily see whether there's discrepancies, whether certain subsets of it are a lot more heavily represented than others. So that's more the proactive approach. Um, the other element here is, is regulation. 
So um, just, uh, just a few months ago, New York City became um, the first in the country to pass a bill for accountability in algorithms. Right? So this is coming our way. And interestingly, in our own research, we're starting to see companies think about this. So a company that we spoke with, Numerate, that also got a Lux ticket positive, they are developing an AI platform to target diseases um, that are um, you know, hard to develop for. And then what they do is they incorporate statistical models to preemptively handle bias. So they look at things like academic publications in terms of training their, their AI. And so they've already put in um, systems in place to help to guard against bias. So we've talked about three pitfalls so far. These are still very much works in progress, and we're not going to handle all of it today. But I did want to spend the last third of the talk today around what, what can we do as we begin this AI journey? What are some best practices that we can implement? So let's talk about developing our AI roadmap. Number one, and this is a bit of a mouthful, get buy-in from your CEO, but start small, iterate quickly to show return on investment. So let's unpack that a little bit. It really does start in many ways at the very top, right? And, th and this is an example of what good looks like. This is a quote from the CEO of Siemens. And he was talking about digital transformation, including AI, including advanced data science and analytics. And he's saying, look, there's really two choices. On the one hand, you can be a part of this transformation and shape it. Or on the other hand, you can wait around and do nothing and wait for others to transform you and disrupt you. And that level of clarity, if you get that level of clarity and insight and buy-in from your CEO, that's fantastic. If you don't, it's not the end of the world. But if your CEO is not personally pushing for AI, then you do have to be a lot more vigilant around starting small and proving your return on investment and kind of building up that case for why more investment is, is required. But say you do get the green light. I would say this is not really a perfect way or a perfect time to, to get into AI. Jump in and get some battle scars. That is tremendously important to get real world experience yourself. And I would emphasize that you are going to fail. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Kind of looping back to Andreas's talk. There's nothing wrong with failure. And I would go in assuming that your first couple of months, you're going to see a lot of failure. So it's important to fail fast, iterate quickly, so that after six months, after 12 months, you do have those battle scars and you are a lot more savvy about your business at the intersection with AI. And it is getting cheaper than one might think. Right? So say you, say you survey the entirety of data analytics all the way to AI, all the way to deep learning, and you say, well, you know what? Deep learning is the way to go for me. For my application, deep learning is what I want to do. You can now get into deep learning for $249. Um, AWS through, through Amazon, um, you can now get this machine vision enabled camera and start the deep learning project, they say within about 10 minutes and for $250. The second best practice that I want to highlight is upscaling yourself, right? broadening your perspectives to really make the best of AI. So if I say the word Python, is this what comes to mind for, for, for most people, perhaps? Python is uh, an incredibly important and emergent um, programming language within the field of data science. So if you look at data science, this is a survey done on uh, the leading data science community out there. Python is the number one most important tool today when it comes to data science and um, AI practitioners. And as you work your way down, you see some other things, like, for example, TensorFlow, like Amazon Web Services, and, and, and so forth. Now, I'm not advocating that everybody go pick up a Python 101 book and become Python programmers. Absolutely not. But learning the ecosystem, learning about the challenges is very, very important. And so part of the same survey, this is a question, what are the barriers that, is, that are faced at work by data scientists, by AI developers? What are the barriers that they face? And you see here things like dirty data, lack of talent, lack of financial support, lack of clear questions to answer. 
we don't have time to focus on all of these, but I will highlight a couple of them. One of them is the lack of data science talent, which is a very real problem. I love this figure. This figure is a map of TensorFlow usage, which is one of the key tools that was highlighted on a previous slide. This is a map of TensorFlow usage around the world. And so Google's TensorFlow is the most downloaded AI platform out there today. And as you might expect, there's a lot of activity in Silicon Valley. But there's a lot of activity in the Midwest as well, and then in the upper Northeast. Move over to the EU. You've got the UK, Germany. You've got China, Thailand, Japan, South Korea. There's an incredible amount of talent within AI that is emerging all around the world. And companies are beginning to capitalize on that talent. So for example, this is a quote from uh, Fei Fei Li, who's one of the key leaders within Google. And in opening up a brand new AI R&D center within China, she said, you know, frankly, we want to work with the best AI talent, no matter where that talent is. So it's that kind of broadening of perspectives that um, is, is really a best, best practice within this. Number three is being paranoid. And that might be a strong word, but being paranoid about embedding your teams within real business challenges day in and day out. And what I mean by that is that some of these problems, I would say, are hard but obvious, right? So if you don't have enough money to go out and hire data scientists, it's a big problem, but it's also a problem that is, is, is very clear. If you do then get the money, but you can't find the right talent to hire, it's too expensive, there's not enough of them, and so forth. Again, very hard problem, but obvious. The things that most people miss are these ones here. I would say this is the kiss of death for AI efforts. If you don't have a clear question to answer, if your results are not being used by decision makers, if you can't explain data science and its results to others, these are very, very important things to watch out for. And so a, a really great way around this is to avoid the classic pitfall of hiring a, very, a bunch of very, very intelligent people and kind of siloing them away. You know, don't hire a data science team and put them in a garage somewhere, tell them to come back in three years with an amazing breakthrough. That, that almost never happens and companies typically don't have the luxury of doing that. Um, what I would highly recommend instead is to really try to embed your data scientist to work alongside the other core parts of your business so that data scientists are talking day in and day out with customers, whether they are internal customers or external customers, so that things like what question am I answering is crystal clear. And so with that, I want to bring it all together here around building your AI roadmap. And so I want to finish with a quote from, again, the CEO of Google. And this, this might seem like an overhyped quote. I, I, don't, I don't think it's overhyped if we take a long enough view, which is that AI is probably the most important thing that humanity has ever worked on. That's, that's probably a true statement if we take a long enough view. And an implication of that is our generation including you, the people in, the, uh, in this audience, are going to be key in helping the world navigate that tremendous disruption. But where do we start? And I would say we need to put this quote here, right? AI is probably the most important thing that humanity has ever worked on. Let's put that post-2030. Let's walk back to 2018 and think about Let's build a really good data science team. Let's get the data science fundamentals in place. Let's sync up our efforts with the CEO's vision. Make sure that as we take our first steps in this direction, it does align with the business goals of the company in the next few years. Then as we begin to hit our stride and we start to deploy some of these systems, keep fighting against bias. Supervise your AI very, very closely with human-in-the-loop systems. As you become more and more of a leader in these efforts, you need to continually upskill yourself. Look broad. There's going to be a lot of new research, a lot of new ideas, and it's going to be a challenge to keep up with a lot of that. And even once you might get comfortable in your current role, 
you need to always be paranoid about embedding your data science teams, your data science efforts for your company within real business problems. And finally, once we get far enough out, this is gonna be broader than just a particular team. This is going to start affecting a large amount of your company, and there's gonna be um, help required and expertise required to help people adapt and reskill and kind of reshape their roles for the future of an AI plus human um, workforce. And so with that, I wanted to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm delighted to take questions.